Um, just to give a little intro to Wild Ones Twin Cities, if you're not familiar with us, um, our mantra is healing the earth one yard at a time. And so Liz was scheduled to be our finale speaker for May. Uh, we go from September to May with our programming. And she was the last speaker of the year, very much on purpose, because what she has done is very much in keeping with healing the earth one yard at a time. Since 2008, she has transformed her half acre suburban yard in Bloomington into a typical sterile green grass environment into something that has not only been a transformation with what she's planted, but what she's been able to attract to her yard is truly a stunning story of build it and they will come. So at this point, I'm just gonna turn it over to Liz and she's gonna have a very, her presentation is great because it's very visual and she's gonna share what she's done since 2008. So take it away, Liz. Thanks, Leslie. I'd um, like to say welcome to everyone and especially uh, thanks to Holly and Leslie for their help in organizing and putting us together and their encouragement and all the little practice runs we've done. Um, it's, been, it's been great to help with that logistically and and everyone being flexible and still allowing this presentation to happen and for the Twin Cities Wild Ones uh, chapter for hosting this presentation. So thanks to everyone for being here tonight. And we'll get started. I'd like to just uh, mention here kind of the uh, topics I'm going to cover and then you have a little bit of expectation of what, um, what we'll be going through. And I have a lot of slides to go through, so I'm going to try to pace myself and hopefully not take too long or go too quickly. Um, but what we'd like to start with here is I'll just give a little introduction to myself and my yard. Uh, and in doing so, give some before and after for context so you can kind of see, like Leslie said, where it started and how far it's come over the years. And then discuss what is a wildlife garden, at least my definition of that, and what also isn't a wildlife garden, because I think it's important to understand. Um, the difference and then what I believe goes into a wildlife garden uh, and I'll, we'll go into some detail about that with a lot of photos to, to illustrate and how how does a wildlife garden fit in a suburban environment I live in a suburb um, and I imagine a lot of people do so we have to understand how to do that within that context and then strategies for sharing space with wildlife because we use it for humans as well as the wildlife. So how do we all share, share the space and coexist? Then strategies, um, so strategies for that, and then steps that you can take in your yard if you wanna get started or improve your wildlife habitat, and then we'll finish up with some Q&A. Now, throughout the course of this discussion, you'll see a lot of photos. Um, all of the photos that you see in this presentation were taken by me in my yard, and a lot of them were taken just with my phone. I get a lot of questions about my camera setup and so on. A lot were just taken with my phone, um, a lot with uh, DSLR with a macro lens or a super telephoto, especially the bird photos. Um, these photos that I've, I've chosen here are selected to demonstrate really how wildlife uses the habitat that I've provided in the yard. And then I also would like to give you a little background, just a few fun facts about each species that you see. And then that helps also reinforce some of those concepts that I'll be talking about. So uh, by way of fun facts here, in this particular example, in this photo inset here, you see a clear wing hummingbird moth. It's visiting a native wild bergamot, and this is right by my back patio. Now, hummingbird moths are similar to hummingbirds, uh, for those of you maybe that have seen them. Um, they're diurnal, meaning they're active during the day, and they actually hold their position while hovering at a flower to sip at nectar, so very similar to a hummingbird. And because they're almost the same size as a, as a small hummingbird, sometimes they might be, at first glance, mistaken for a hummingbird. Um, and they're host plants, which means where their caterpillars uh, um, eat food and where, the, where their adults lay the eggs um, include viburnum, such as cranberry, nannyberry, snowberry shrubs. And over the winter, they burrow into the soil and remain there as a cocoon. So just some fun facts about clearing hummingbird moths. I typically see these in the summer in my yard. Um, they're, they're relatively common, so, but they're really cool to see. So that's what we have there. I'd also like to just mention some of the, the goals I have for this presentation as far as what I'd like you to come away with, at least um, from my perspective. Um, and I hope everybody received the uh, resources and links and species list handout that uh, was sent out in the original email. Um, it's, 
by no means a complete list, but I just wanted to cover a few things and, and give everybody something to, to look at and, and maybe to do some further research on. Um, I'm all, of course, I'm available to answer questions and, and so on. Um, so what I'd like you to take away though from this presentation really is some additional knowledge about some of the species that you might expect to see in a typical suburban habitat. Of course, we'll talk about my specific habitat and what you see really depends on what your circumstances are and your yard layout and the surrounding habitats and that. So my yard's really just one example of that. Um, I'd really like you to understand how wildlife interacts with the habitat that you provide and we'll see a lot of examples of that through my photos and just in the discussion. And I really like to focus on the safety of the wildlife that we invite into our habitats that we create. So we'll go into some detail about that as well. And then some steps that uh, can be taken to improve your, uh, your wildlife habitat that you're either even create if you're just starting out or improve what you already have. And ultimately what I'd really like you to come away with is inspiration to take some action in that regard. So here we have a red-headed woodpecker. Uh, this was in my backyard. I've seen them three, a total of three times in the 15 years I've lived here. Um, they're one of nine species of woodpeckers in Minnesota, which seven of which we get this, this uh, southern part of the state. And one of the, they're, they're actually in decline quite a bit. Their North American population has declined by about 80% in the last 20 years. And that's mainly due to loss of their oak savanna habitat. They need mature, lots of mature oak trees. And also uh, from competition, uh, uh, with European starlings, which is an invasive species. Um, there's a really good population. If you're interested in seeing them, if you visit Cedar Creek Science Reserve north of town, they have great habitat there, and you can go there and see lots of red-headed woodpeckers, and they're just a stunning bird, as you can see. This was right outside by my, um, my patio, or by my deck, which is right next to the feeders, and so it was going to, to eat some peanuts at the feeders when I saw it. All right, just a little bit about me. I mentioned I was going to tell you just my background, and this gives you maybe some context for my perspective on things. Um, I've been a volunteer with the Minnesota Master Naturalist Program since 2009. Um, I don't have a gardening or a formal gardening or landscaping background. Um, I'm just a trial by error gardener, um, and I don't have a lot of expertise in that area beyond what, what I share tonight and kind of the path I've taken here. <clears throat> My day, do, day job actually is I'm a software developer, so I, I don't have any professional um, landscaping experience or anything like that. A lot of people ask me that. It always kind of surprises me. Um, <clears throat> I've been volunteering with the, or I had volunteered with the Raptor Center for five years, uh, while the Freehab Center, and a current volunteer with Richardson Nature Center. Um, and so that influences a lot of my perspective on things, as you'll see. Um, I've lived in Bloomington for 15 years now, uh, right near the Minnesota River, so that provides some good habitat. Again, my yard is just one example of, of the habitat um, that I can provide. Um, that really influences what species come to my yard as far as what's in proximity to my yard. Um, my yard was initially completely full of buckthorn, white mulberry, invasive species, honeysuckles, things like that. Um, it's been quite a, quite a journey to <laughs> convert all that. And I started planting the backyard in 2008, and it's, it's amazing uh, how time has flown since then. Um, and we'll see kind of that before, a little bit of before and after. And then the front yard I started uh, in 2013. So my initial goal with wildlife gardening really was to attract more birds. That was what got me into it. And so I initially started with planting a lot of fruit bearing shrubs. Uh, with this wildlife rehab kind of uh, interest and a lot of volunteer experience, that gets me very focused on wildlife safety, and so that's why it's a big uh, component of my talk. Um, I'm not really, I don't really consider myself like a gardener. What I'm really interested in is what wildlife is attracted to the yard versus the aesthetics of the garden. I mean, everybody likes a pretty garden, but I'm very interested in the function of each uh, native plants that I provide as in how it benefits the wildlife that comes to the yard. This is the one photo that was not taken in my yard. This was at Richard, Richardson Nature Center where I uh, volunteer with the raptors. And this is uh, one of our prior education birds. She's now at the Milwaukee Zoo. Uh, it's a barred owl. And what happened with her is she, she fell from her nest and somebody, instead of taking her to rehab, they kept her and tried to feed her and take care of her on their own. And then what happened was she was imprinted on humans. And so she's unreleasable because she can't. Uh, relate to her own species at all. It's a, more of a psychological injury. 
So just kind of by way of information there, if you, if you ever find an orphaned or injured uh, bird or any kind of wildlife, make sure you immediately contact a qualified rehabber. Um, don't take matters into your own hands because a lot of times you might do more harm than good as, what, as is what happened with this owl who otherwise physically was never injured. So here's a, just for some context, here's a Google Earth view of my, my yard. Um, this is not really a current, it's not completely current. I forget what year this was taken, um, but it just kind of gives you an idea of the layout. I have a long kind of deep lot. Um, it's about half an acre. <clears throat> it's kind of this odd shape, but the nice thing is I have a lot of privacy in the back. We have a lot of mature trees in the neighborhood, including a lot of burr oaks, a very well-drained and sandy soil being near the river. Um, this street here, you see it runs north-south, and it ends at a cul-de-sac actually on the river bluff. And the uh, big clump of green there in the, the top right, there is a, um, a nice stand of white pine. So we have, we have some varied habitat in here. We have some part shade, some full shade, and some sun. So that's what I have going on in the yard. And next we'll see a little bit before and after. So how did it all start out? This is what the backyard looked like um, right after we moved in. This is in 2006, we moved in in 2005. So of course the very first thing I did was put up bird feeders and uh, these bluebird boxes. <clears throat> but other than that, all we have is just a large blank expanse of just weedy grass, a lot of invasive uh, things back there. It's kind of hard to see in this photo, but towards the back there's just tons of buckthorn and everything. Um, and just take note of where those bird boxes are because they serve as a good reference point for subsequent photos such as this one from 2016, where uh, we had done some planting eight years before, kind of over time it built up, and you can see this nice stand of sweet Joe Pye weed, which is this tall plant on the right, and all the invasive shrubs had been removed at this point, and we planted a lot of other wildflowers and things, and those bird boxes are still in the same spot that they were, so you can just kind of see how that, that part of the yard's changed. I got a few more before and after here. This is towards the far back of the yard where it was just basically a jungle of buckthorn and all kinds of other stuff. And actually what happened here was there was a storm. And so I had gone back there to take some pictures of the damage. So you can see a lot of stuff has fallen over. Um, but it's, it's just a jungle back there. It's just basically all of it's invasive. So it took several years to remove. And then you can see <clears throat> nine years later, that same spot where uh, moved all, removed all those invasive shrubs, um, and we have a nice path through there, and some nice wildflowers and some good habitat, and a nice little wild ones uh, habitat sign there right in the middle, uh, just a post that was already there. Um, a lot of the native shrubs I've incorporated, um, as I mentioned before, initially I did this with the motivation of attracting birds. So we had a lot of fruit growing shrubs. So we've got gray dogwood, nanny berry, service berry, um, winter berry, choke berry, just all kinds, all the berries, we've got tons of them. And they seem to do pretty well <clears throat> back, in, back in that part of the yard. They provide good habitat. Here's our back patio uh, back in 2007, again, after that storm. And that's why I took this picture because a big tree, huge ash tree branch fell and basically demolished our deck. Um, so I was kind of documenting that, but you can just see this horrible uh, weedy grass, just no habitat there. I mean, there's, there is this one oak tree, but other than that, um, there's not much going on. And it's, not only is it not good habitat for wildlife, but it's not even really a very inviting place for humans. It's just a bunch of weeds. So, I mean, we could have taken the route of, oh, let's, let's restore this lawn and let's make it all nice and green and manicured and everything. Um, but that's not the route we took. Instead, we, we did that. And that's several years later. And now it's not only a uh, great wildlife habitat, but also just a nicer place to sit out there, enjoy the, the birds and the bees and the butterflies and everything that's, that's surrounding the patio now, and a much nicer view. And, um, we'll, we see a few things here on the, in the scene that we'll actually get into some more detail later as far as um, some of the wildlife features that, that we've incorporated. So the last 
believe this is the last before and after. This is in the front yard and I took a lot more time to get to the front yard, partially because I was so preoccupied with the backyard. It was quite, our backyard's quite large, <clears throat> but also because I was a little reluctant to be so experimental in the front. The backyard was all trial and error, DIY, you know, a lot of um, just throw it out, throw something up against the wall and see if it works. You know, a lot of research on my part. I was reluctant uh, to do that in the front yard for reasons I'll, I'll get into a bit later. Um, but you can see what we started with, again, was kind of just the boring, um, not much going on in the front, just some ugly shrubs and there's black plastic and river rock and just this ugly edging and just not any curb appeal and not really much wildlife habitat to speak of. So then in 2015, sometimes these frames advance a little bit, a little bit quicker than I want. <coughs> so there we go. So this is the same spot. Um, you can see there's a lot a lot more going on here. That's actually turned out to be great wildlife habitat. We've got some a variety of wildflowers. We have a, um, a showy mountain ash that's that small tree there and a lot of shrubs and uh, it's just a, not only great habitat for wildlife but also I think aesthetically a lot better curb appeal. So this is just one of several garden beds in the front that we have now. Um, so that's a little bit of context uh, of where we started and kind of where we progressed to. It's even more has happened even since I took these photos, um, but it, hopefully it gives you a little bit of background and uh, you can kind of see how, how drastically things can change, you know, given enough time and some effort. So next let's, let's talk about what is a wildlife garden. So this is my, my definition. Um, it's adapted from the uh, National Wildlife Federation Certified uh, Habitat Program, um, which you can, I think, I think I may have included a link on the resources for that. Um, basically, it's the primary, the primary purpose of this type of garden is to create a diverse habitat. It needs to be diverse to fully support wildlife. Uh, native wildlife is uh, certainly what, what we prefer. And supporting its ability to create complete all or part of its natural life cycle. Um, and you have to provide several elements for that to happen, including food, water, shelter, and space. And we will talk about each of these in detail and have plenty of illustration. Um, the emphasis on this type of garden is on, how, is on how species other than humans will use the garden. So we can see an example here, this broadwing hawk is sitting in the far back part of the yard it's perched on utility lines right in, right in the back. Um, this is a very a common hawk that you'll see in woodland habitats like we have. And they're typically a mammal hunting hawk. So they're normally not hunting songbirds, but mostly small mammals, chipmunks and mice and whatnot. Um, they're highly migratory. So they go all the way down to Southern Mexico and Northern South America for the winter. They're one of the first birds to leave in the fall for migration because they have such a a long migration and one of the last to arrive. But then once they're here, they're actually quite common in suburban habitats. Um, I actually was down in Colombia in South America in December and I saw one of these down there. So I thought that was really cool to see one in this winter habitat. And these guys migrate in large flocks, which can consist of thousands of birds. So there would be these huge kettles of them, thousands and thousands of them all going together uh, at one time. Okay, so what's not a wildlife garden? So weeds and grass, just you let your lawn go, you decide I'm gonna have a wildlife garden and just never mow my grass again. That's not really a wildlife garden. Um, lawns and yards that look neglected um, annoy neighbors. They contribute to negative stereotypes um, and that, that, doesn't help the, that doesn't help wildlife. And also you may get in trouble with whatever um, city you live in. So just have to be careful about that. You don't want to, ultimately, if your goal is to help wildlife, you know, you want to have a positive, uh, a positive uh, impact on that. If you have a yard full of invasive species like buckthorn and so on, like I did, I mean, there was wildlife that came to the yard um, and maybe 
sort of can consider that habitat. But um, if you're if you're propagating invasive species in your yard, then you're harming the environment beyond your yard, and that's I don't think that's a very good thing to do either. Um, empty and dirty bird feeders. Uh, when I drive around town, I see lots of those. They don't attract birds and they don't make attractive lawn ornaments. So those aren't really helpful, nor are they good uh, features for wildlife habitat. If you have ne put up nest boxes in your yard for birds or bees or whatever other wildlife, uh, you need to make sure they're safe. And we'll, we'll get into some detail about that. Um, but if you have unsafe nest boxes that are not maintained, they leave oc occupants exposed to the weather and vulnerable to predators. Um, it's better to have no nest boxes at all than to have any unsafe nest boxes. And of course, if you have chemicals, pesticides, um, herbicides in your lawn and in your garden, um, they not only harm the wildlife in your yard directly, but then they also impact the surrounding environment. So we don't want that. Um, so those are just a few things I could think of that would not make up a wildlife garden. So let's talk about some of the essential wildlife, essential elements of a wildlife garden in some more detail and pertaining to those points I just gave. Oh, and I forgot to, uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, so the first obvious element that we discussed is food and water. Um, food can consist of, and can and should consist of native plants. Um, so wildlife can use that to directly feed from seeds, leaves, from the nectar, pollen, prey that's attracted to those plants. And then you can also provide feeders um, that must be kept clean and well stocked uh, with species and season appropriate food. Man-made feeders supplement native plant food sources. Um, so for example, contrary to popular belief, a lot of people think this, uh, feeders do not prevent birds from migrating. So they're fine, it's fine to have supplemental uh, feeders, but just view them as, as such, they are supplemental to the native uh, plants and the other natural food sources that are in your yard as well as the surrounding habitat. And we'll talk, uh, and also emphasis on it, any of these man-made uh, feeder, feeders that you provide, emphasis on they must be kept clean. And we'll talk about that in some more detail later. An example here uh, that we have of some food, wildlife food, is this monarch butterfly caterpillar on common milkweed. Insect larvae have very specific host plants that they're adapted to and that they can eat. So monarchs uh, are specific, monarch larvae uh, are specific to various, we have several species of milkweed, but they're very specific to that. So they must have milkweed in order to lay their eggs and then the caterpillars feed from milkweed as they go through their five stages of growth. There are actually 14 species of native milkweeds in Minnesota and I have six growing in my yard. So again, providing that diverse habitat of different bloom times and that helps throughout the, the season, the, the breeding season. So, and monarchs also are, are just one of many species that utilize milkweed. So the female butterfly lays her eggs on the leaves, the caterpillar feed on that plant, they actually eat the leaves throughout their stages of growth. And we'll actually see a, another photo later that shows you just how small these eggs are on milkweed. So next we'll see some, just some, go through some photos with some examples of wildlife, additional wildlife using man-made feeders as well as natural uh, plants in the garden. I have a lot of photos. So here's a species specific type of feeder. This is an example, of course, of a man-made bird feeder and that provides uh, seed for goldfinches. So these are American goldfinches on a thistle feeder that I have hanging off my deck. It's very specific for goldfinches, for this type of seed and for the, the way they eat. Goldfinches, a lot of people don't know this, but goldfinches actually stay in Minnesota year round. They aren't often really noticed in the winter because their plumage changes to kind of a drab color versus that brilliant yellow that they have in the breeding season like they have now. They're actually our latest nesting songbirds. So they, let, they don't nest until late, late June through mid-August. And they build, that's because they're timing their nests with the availability of milkweed and thistledown, which they use to build their nests. And they're one of the very few bird species that 
are primarily not insect eaters. They mostly eat seeds and they also feed their young seeds. And because of that, if you have them in your yard, it's also very, very helpful to them if you provide a reliable source of, of fresh, clean water because they're not getting that moisture from insects, but rather from other water sources. So always keep a nice, clean bird bath for them, if possible. This is kind of an unusual photo here, and I thought it was kind of a, a, a cool example. This is another type of bird feeder. This is a suet feeder. And what we have here are yellow rumped warblers actually swarming it because this hat, this, I took this picture during migration and it was a very cool spring migration that year. So there were no insects available for them to eat because most birds are primarily insect eaters and especially warblers like this. So they, yellow rumped warblers are one of our earliest, if not the earliest migrating warbler species that comes through in the spring. And they're also the last to leave in the fall. So they can tolerate pretty cold temperatures, but they do need a, a food source. So when they come through and it's cold, then a lot of times they will visit feeders like the suet feeder. <clears throat> and they don't nest here, they continue north and they nest in the boreal forest. So we're just south of their breeding range but they're very common during migration. <clears throat> Excuse me. They've already moved through here uh, this spring, um, but they usually come right through and there's a ton of them around. One of the most common warblers that you'll see during migration. And you can also help them not only by providing suet, but if you uh, get dried millworms, you can scatter those on the ground and they'll forage on the ground and, and eat those. So it's a nice, nice protein source for them. Here's another example of a, of a feeder. Uh, in this case, it's a live mealworm feeder. And this, here we have a female bluebird. She's the adult on the right feeding her fledgling on the left. Uh, it's kind of funny because the fledgling is perfectly capable of eating mealworms right out of the dish itself, but it's begging for its mom to come and feed it. So while it sits on the dish, so I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, but those are actually live mealworms in that dish. And you can also feed them wax worms. Uh, you can get those at a bait shop. Uh, and the interesting thing about these guys is they are, um, well, I should say mealworm, you should look at mealworms as basically just a supplement, a supplemental food source to their, um, supplement to the wild, the wild food that they would get. There's not really enough, you don't want them just eating mealworms, but again, this is an example of a man-made feeder being a supplement to their, their wild diet. So if we provide a lot of native habitat, then they'll have access to that wild, those wild food sources as well. But it's nice to, to help them out a little bit, especially if it's a cold spring or a rainy day, that sort of thing, then it, it really helps them, helps them out. Eastern bluebirds are a thrush. They're in the thrush family. So they're related to robins and other thrushes. And if you know, you can see that with this juvenile here, it's got a spotted breast. So um, you might have noticed that with uh, fledgling robins, they have a spotted breast. So it's very typical of thrushes. And in the first half of the 20th century, blue, bluebirds were almost wiped out by house sparrows, <clears throat> which are an invasive species that was brought over here from Europe. And actually in the, in the 70s, and even as late into the 1970s here in Minnesota, there were counties in Minnesota where they they were doing surveys and they didn't even find any bluebirds. So it's really through the effort of a lot of conservationists that the species has re rebounded through the control of invasive species. They can easily be trained to come to a feeder for these live mealworms. What I do when they're nesting in my yard is I just go out there and whistle and they eventually come to associate the whistle with there's some food arriving and so that's kind of fun to do that. Here's an example of a natural food source. We have a ruby-throated hummingbird uh, nectaring from a cardinal flower right by my patio. Remember that ugly before picture from the patio? This is right, right in that same spot. Um, hummingbirds are very attracted to anything red, so cardinal flower, any of those red flowers, they really like that. Ruby-throated hummingbirds are the only species of hummingbirds that we typically get in Minnesota or anywhere east of the Rockies. In the world though, in the Western Hemisphere, they're endemic to the Western Hemisphere. There's well over 300 species of hummingbirds. About two dozen of those found in the US, 
and the rest are in Central and South America. So although the adults eat nectar, they feed their chicks insects. So you can provide nectar feeders. A lot of people have hummingbird feeders. Just make sure, again, with the emphasis, keep it clean, especially in warmer weather, they tend to get kind of gross. So clean them out pretty often. And also avoid red dye because that doesn't do anything to attract them. Usually the feeder itself is red and those red dyes just additional chemicals that hummingbirds don't need. Here is another example of native, native plants, wildlife using native plants. They're nectaring, these are monarch butterflies nectaring at Meadow Blazing Star. This is right by my front door. There were probably at least a dozen monarchs here when I took this picture, but I can only get so many in the photo. And this is during late summer when they start to migrate. So they really need to get that energy and have lots of nectar sources available. And Meadow Blazing Star is one of the best plants for that. It's like a butterfly magnet. It's really pretty too, you can see. And it's really, really helpful for monarch butterflies as they're fueling up for that long migration down to Mexico, which is several thousand miles. Um, so I highly encourage you, if you have the chance to plant some of this stuff, it's, it's really great if you want to see monarch butterflies. Um, it's really cool to go out and just see so many of them uh, taking advantage of that and, and helping them out a little bit before they get started on their journey. So here we have a bird eating fruit. This is a native plant, of course. This is a service berry tree in my front yard, small tree. And this is, the bird is a cedar waxwing. Service berries bloom and fruit in the spring. So my service berry has already bloomed and it's just now starting to form fruit and all the birds love it. Cedar waxwings will come to it, robins, um, catbirds, uh, bluebirds sometimes too. But you, especially the cedar waxwing is really associated with eating fruit. <clears throat> the cedar waxwing is actually named for the red cedar. That's where they get the cedar in their name. And the red cedar is a juniper that produces blueberries in the fall. And so you'll see lots of cedar wax, waxwings on those or any juniper really. <clears throat> These guys remain in Minnesota year round. And especially in the winter time, you can see large flocks of them just going around to any source of berries, any fruit bearing trees that are still around or any junipers that still have fruit on them, you can find huge flocks of them. I've, I've seen flocks of 75 to 100 um, in the winter. So that's, that's really cool. So they're attracted, as I mentioned, to junipers, surface berries, dogwoods, which are uh, those, those fruit in the fall, and then mountain ashes and just various other fruit bearing shrubs. Slide doesn't want to advance, let me do that. There we go. Another, another example here of some native plant. This is a caterpillar feeding on the leaves of this prairie pussy toes. The caterpillar is an American lady butterfly caterpillar and pussy toes is one of its host plants. This is a low, ground, a low growing ground cover. It's really good for dry rocky areas. So it's really cool to go out and just see see this patch of pussy toes. This is right in my front yard garden bed um, and just go out there and see it kind of covered in these caterpillars. They're really cool. These butterflies uh, don't overwinter here. They actually migrate to the southern U.S. So unlike, unlike some of the other ones we'll talk about, some overwinter here and some migrate. And this is one of the migratory ones. Oh, sounds like somebody's got their microphone on maybe. Somebody other than me. <laughs> All right, so next let's, uh, let's talk about some water sources. Here's a bird bath. Actually, this is a heated bird bath. So it keeps the water open, uh, just above freezing. It works really well here in the winter. I've had this, this particular one for several years. I just plug it in. This is right by our deck, you can see, and we have an outlet right over there. So it's really helpful to provide a fresh water source in the winter. Um, Birds will eat snow, but they expend less energy if they have open water. So it's just, again, one of those kind of supplemental things to help them get through the winter. Um, you can see this kind of green thing I have floating in it. That's actually, uh, I don't know what you call it, but it helps, 
it helps the birds not get, we don't want them getting in there taking baths and sub freezing temperatures. And I don't think most of them typically do, but this is just an additional protection to make sure that they're not jumping in there and just completely getting wet and then, you know, that would cause some issues for them. I clean and refill this about, usually about every other day. I dump it out in the winter and I bring water from inside and I've got this gallon bucket and I can keep it pretty clean that way. So again, it's important to, to maintain and keep things clean if you're going to provide the future. Here's another type of water source. This is a still pond, very simple to make. It's just a half wine barrel uh, that's, I stapled some pond liner in it to keep the water inside. And this is intended for frogs and dragonflies. Put some uh, submerged rocks and some native plants. That's blue flag iris right there. Have some stems and things. Uh, and having this still water source allows for those species to be able to uh, lay their eggs and have tadpoles or dragonfly larvae. It also does allow for mosquitoes, but those species prey on mosquito larvae, so it gives them a food source. And I do have this out towards the back of the yard, so I just let them be. Um, probably don't want that, at least in my opinion, I don't think I want that really close to the house just because of the mosquitoes, but um, it's, it's kind of a nice feature to have out there. And actually just a couple weeks ago, I went out again with the maintenance and the, the liner was getting kind of gross and had some leaks and, and the water wasn't staying in there. So I pulled all that stuff out, pulled out that pond liner, replaced it. It was mucky and gross, but you know, it's one of those things you have to do. If I'm gonna have this feature out there, I need to make sure it's well maintained. So um, I took this picture right after I first installed it. I don't know how many years ago that was. <clears throat> so the pond liner lasted for a few years, but then I had to go back and replace it just a few weeks ago. And here we have a frog using that, that very pond. So it's kind of cool to go out there and, and make something and then see the wildlife respond like this. So frogs and dragonflies, as well as their prey, need this still water source. So you don't want to stock it with fish or it'll, they'll be predators of those species or you put any kind of filter or pump or anything in it. This northern leopard frog, um, they're pretty common. And they actually used to be one of the most abundant frog species in the U.S., but they've actually been on the decline since the 70s. Uh, habitat loss, all the same reasons that a lot of other species are in decline. Um, so it's nice to just give them a kind of a safe space here that's undisturbed to have a little bit of habitat. No, they'll, they'll roam pretty far away from water, but they do need a water, a still water source like this in the habitat. Here's an example of a moving water feature. This is a waterfall. And here we have another yellow rumped warbler example, taking a bath. And um, the nice thing about these moving water features is that the sight and the sound is really attractive to birds, especially migrants that maybe wouldn't come to feeders. So you, you can get a lot more birds to come in this way. And that was exactly my motivation for installing this. This particular feature is a about a 13 foot long waterfall. There's a small reservoir at the bottom and underneath the ground is a big uh, container that I forget how many gallons it is, but then there's a pump inside and it just keeps continuously pumping it. So there's not, not really a pond here. Um, so it's just basically a moving water feature. So there's not going to be frogs and dragonflies and all in this particular water feature, but I have that elsewhere in the yard. This is pretty low maintenance too. I leave it, I usually leave it running from somewhere in April to somewhere in October, maybe November, just depends on the weather. Uh, it's really easy to remove, disconnect the pump. I just bring it inside over the winter and just leave it, leave it be and then put it back out there come spring. So the next, uh, moving on to the next element, we have shelter and cover. So some examples of, of how you can have some of those elements in your yard. Of course, nest boxes are the obvious ones. Also roosting boxes, we'll see an example of that. Mounted safely and appropriately, of course. Trees and shrubs, natural habitat, also provide protection from the weather, from predators. They provide roosting and nesting sites for all different kinds of species. Of course, I'm very bird-centric, so I tend to just talk about that, but it's not just, not just about birds, but I, I do tend to focus on that. 
Uh, other elements you can provide beyond that are brush piles, rock piles. Uh, those also provide uh, overwintering habitat, predator, uh, a way to escape from predators, food sources, that sort of thing. And snags and fallen logs also can provide those, those uh, features. We'll see some examples of all of these. Right here you can see, of course, an eastern bluebird on sitting on top of a nest box. He's actually singing, singing, and the female was inside, so he's trying to show her a good spot to nest at this point. Cute little guy. Here's an, a man-made a man-made nest box. This is a, a bee nest box. Um, it says facing southeast for the morning sun, so you know, make sure you're aware of how it's mounted and where it's mounted, so it's going to provide that benefit to the wildlife. Most native bees nest in the ground, but about 30% or so nest in cavities like plant stems and, and so on. So you can provide kind of this artificial nest, uh, nest box with these tubes that you can see some bees have nested in and then they pack the mud and they lay their eggs, they pack the mud in there and then they emerge. And you can kind of see where somebody's emerged and this broken out of their little mud, their little mud wall there. Here's a natural, a natural bee nest location and a plant stem. So it's just an example of, you know, having a combination of man-made as well as natural features to help out these species. <laughs> In this case, what we've got is a coneflower stem that's been excavated by a bee, and you can kind of see that white substance that's on the leaf of the uh, coneflower there, and that's where this bee has gone in and excavated uh, out the lining of this plant stem and just kind of left it there. So what you can do to help, help bees with, with native shelter is, um, or with natural shelter, is to leave your plant standing over the winter and then in the spring you cut back the stems, not all the way to the ground, but you know, a foot or a foot and a half in height, and then that gives them some space to go in and, and make their nest in there. And then when the plants grow tall, you're not even going to notice those plant stems. I see a lot of good questions flipping by on the chat, so that's great to see that that discussion and enthusiasm. Here we have a, another bird nest box. We have a black cat chickadee at the entrance of the box and then looking down, um, the way this box works is you take it down and you look down into, uh, from above down into it. So I found this cute little scene of all these chickadees crammed in there um, and I, had, I couldn't resist getting a picture. I did it really quick so as not to upset the parents too much. Uh, but that's exactly, that's an example of what a chickadee nest actually looks like on the inside. So this is a species appropriate nest box with the right dimensions, the whole size, the depth, uh, has proper protection from predators. This is just one of many different, it's actually a bluebird box in this case, um, but it's one of many different styles. It's species appropriate, mounted appropriately on a, a pole. Um, make sure you don't use decorative nest boxes. You could buy, buy those just at you know, furniture store, or just someplace that doesn't specialize in, in uh, wild birds. Uh, a lot of times those kind of nest boxes are really unsafe. They don't provide protection from the weather. They don't have proper venting. They have features that actually might encourage predators and may not be mounted, you know, don't mount it on the side of a house or on a tree. You want to make sure you understand what species that are using these boxes, what species you have in your area, what their nesting habits are, and that you're able to, it's a big responsibility, honestly. Um, so you wanna, you just wanna understand what species are using these features of your yard, especially when it comes to nest boxes, and just make sure that you've done all the research. And I think I provided a link in the resources for um, Nestwatch that has a lot of great information about all the different species that we use nest boxes and what what the dimensions and, and how to mount them and all the information you need to safely provide those nesting spaces. So black cat chickadees are an example of secondary cavity nesters, meaning they don't excavate their own cavity. They will use a natural cavity or something that's already been excavated by a woodpecker or somebody else that's a primary ca cavity nester. They will lay up to 13 eggs. So you can imagine how crowded this box would get with what, it's got six chicks in there. Um, the most I've seen, I think, in one of these nest boxes has been eight, eight eggs. But they'll lay up to 13 and they make their nest out of moss. So if you have moss in your yard, you'll see chickadees using that and they'll line it with fur. You can kind of see to make it soft. 
and they typically only raise one brood per season. Other, other species might raise several. Uh, one interesting fact um, about chickadees, there was a, a study done, I think a few years back, and it actually takes between six and 9,000 caterpillars to feed one brood of chickadees. So that's su super important to have these native plants around that support all these caterpillars that the chickadees need to feed just as one brood of chicks. Yeah, it is a cute picture, isn't it? <laughs> I love this picture. Here's another, here's another cute one. Here's another a different bluebird box. Remember the picture I showed you with the weedy expanse, expanse of, of grass in the backyard and I put up those bluebird boxes. This is one of those. So think, don't just think about the growing season, the gardening season, the nesting breeding season. Also think about the rest of the year. So here's an example of where I've winterized one of these bluebird boxes. Um, I plugged up the vent holes as best I could with some insulation to help retain body heat. And then what we have is other species that will use these spaces to roost in over the winter. So you could see uh, chickadees, nuthatches, woodpeckers. Nobody's nesting in there, of course, at that time. Uh, but here we have an example of a downy woodpecker actually roosting, <coughs> roosting in one of these uh, bluebird boxes in my backyard. And it's so cute to go out in the morning and I see this little face looking out at me. And uh, so I had, to, I had to grab a picture. I think I, I took this just this past winter. Downy woodpeckers are the smallest woodpecker species in North America. They're very common, super common uh, visitors to your backyard bird feeders. And they're widespread throughout the continent. And that's an example of a primary nesting, uh, primary cavity nester. So they do excavate their own cavities. Uh, in this case, of course, it's not nesting, it's just roosting. But a lot of times they'll roost in, you know, natural, uh, the cavities that they've excavated over the winter. So in this case, for whatever reason, this downy woodpecker chose to roost in one of my bluebird boxes. And I've, I've seen that hatches and chickadees do the same. Here's just a barred owl roosting in the, that stand of white pine trees. So kind of giving some space and availability uh, to the species to do that. Um, oops, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking at, <laughs> I was looking ahead too far. Uh, this, this case here, we have a gray tree frog roosting on a swamp milkweed leaf. And this kind of an example of just, you wouldn't really think about a leaf being somewhere that a, somebody would roost on, but these guys are actually nocturnal, primarily nocturnal. So they're mostly inactive during the day. And the cool thing about these uh, gray tree frogs is that they can actually change color. So you can see he's really green, but he's sitting on a green leaf. So he's camouflaging himself from potential predators. Um, these guys are able to climb trees. They have these really sticky toe pads and they overwinter partially frozen under leaf litter. And there's kind of this recurring theme you'll see of leaf litter being really important for all these different species. Okay, now to the owl. There we go. So there's a, a barred owl. I was working from home one day, this was a couple years ago, and I just heard the crows just absolutely going crazy out in the backyard. So I knew there had to be an owl or something out there. And I looked and looked and looked, and I finally found it. This is really up high in the pine trees. And I could only look through, there's like this one little window between all the branches and everything, and I was able to see it. Um, eventually the crows gave up and that barred owl stayed there all day long roosting in that pine tree. So it's nice habitat for it to um, spend some time during the day. And they're pretty common. Uh, we get them here frequently. They're, uh, they're a nocturnal owl found in wooded areas, a lot of times near wetlands or rivers or just any kind of uh, water habitat. They eat small mammals, amphibians, snakes, lots of small things like that. Uh, that was a really cool find in the backyard. Here's another type of shelter cover location. This is a brush pile and it provides, it can provide a food source. There's a lot of insects and things that can be in there for birds to find and also cover from predators. So this is a Lincoln sparrow, one of our many uh, native sparrow species. These guys come through, they're a boreal nesting species, so they don't nest here, they go further north, but they're 
Um, we've got a, over, a, well, about a dozen native sparrow species that we can see here in Minnesota at different times of year. Some are here in the summer, some are here in the winter, and some are migrating through. This is one of the migrants. This is right by my, uh, my deck. Here's a fallen log. This actually was an intentionally placed fallen log. It didn't just fall. This is in the front yard. And a little notch cut out for whatever critters may want to hide in there. Um, so, and also these rocks as well can provide some, some shelter. Um, as well as just kind of a decorative look, something, some visual interest in the garden bed. So functional and also something for, uh, you know, visual appeal as well. Here's another cute one. I took this a um, couple months ago, maybe, can't remember. So this is a flying squirrel, a southern flying squirrel, taking shelter in a natural tree cavity. This is in a bur oak tree in the backyard. These guys are really small. They're a lot smaller than just a normal gray squirrel. And they are omnivorous. They're very, actually very common. Uh, they'll visit bird feeders quite often, but they're extremely nocturnal, so people don't see them a lot. And they're another example of a secondary cavity nester. They don't excavate their own cavities, but they'll take over a natural cavity or a, something a woodpecker's already excavated. All right, so some tips and best practices. Um, Consider how wildlife is going to use your garden all throughout the year, not just during the growing season, because it's not, it's not just about flowers. Um, let your garden stand over the winter. Um, wait until the spring to cut, mow, or burn it. And especially if you can, wait until the temperatures get warm enough for insects to emerge, as we've talked about. Insects like to overwinter underneath a lot of leaf litter and in those plant stems and things. Um, and it also provides a food source. Uh, various types for uh, and cover for birds as well as other critters and leaf litter again leave the leave the leaves leaves and fallen logs if you can they provide great great habitat many insects and and amphibians and frogs and things will use that that also has a benefit of you have less work to do in the fall and more visual interest over the winter so here we have a woolly bear caterpillar and this is the larval stage of a, the Isabella tiger moth uh, which is a small yellow moth. They only live for a few weeks, they, the moth does, but the caterpillar overwinters in the leaf litter and it can survive being frozen solid over winter. So here's what my garden looks like in the fall. You can see I've let that big stand of, of plants just, uh, just remain standing. So it's more visual interest maybe, I guess depending on your idea of visual interest, I suppose. Um, but there's all, that's all great habitat. And then here's what the same looks like in the winter. So I don't know what all is under that snow, but I think there's a lot of critters that are overwintering under it. And then of course, there's still some seeds and things for the birds to eat. Here's an example of somebody taking uh, advantage of that leaf litter. So this is a white-throated sparrow. They come through during migration and they like to forage in the leaf litter, scratching it at the leaf litter for seeds and insects. They winter in the southern U.S. and they'll migrate through and nest in the in Canada and points north. Well, another one of our native sparrow species. Here's a tiger swallowtail butterfly I found in the garden really early in the spring, so I have to assume it, it must have just emerged. These overwinter as a chrysalis in the garden, again in the leaf litter, so very, very important. This is kind of cool. Um, I found this big caterpillar. This is a polyphemus moth caterpillar. Uh, they overwinter as a cocoon in the leaf litter and they have host plants, uh, a lot of different trees and shrubs. And then last summer I actually found a, an adult moth, which they're huge as you can see um, just by size comparison with my hand. They actually have no mouth parts so they don't eat and the moth actually only lives a few days. So it's kind of cool, but it's really spectacular. That was, I was very excited to find that. That was in the front yard. Uh, continuing on with some tips and best practices, be really vigilant with um, invasive species. It's always a battle. Um, initially, you know, there's like, I had to remove tons of, of these invasive species, and I still just have to be on the lookout for them. So I'm always pulling like little buckthorns and things to just keep it at bay. 
convert unused areas of lawn to productive space. So consider if you're not using that part of the yard, consider letting wildlife use it if you're not. And then also allow contiguous, if you can, if you have the space for it, of course, um, contiguous and undisturbed areas of native plants that really helps the pollinators to have easier access and just less disturbance overall to the wildlife and just diversity of habitat. Action shot of, uh, oh, you can see. <laughs> yeah, action shot of me uh, killing some buckthorn there. I got real handy with the chainsaw there for a few years. And then a big thing of garlic mustard that I pulled. I didn't take a, I didn't bother taking a picture of the garlic mustard when it was in the ground. I really had no motivation to do that, but um, I've been pulling it. I don't have a ton of garlic mustard anymore, but again, it's one of these invasive species. Both of these just take over woodland habitats and crowd out native species, um, outcompete them, and they don't provide any, any if any, uh, benefit to wildlife at all. And then birds will eat the berries of the buckthorn and spread the seeds. These seeds can stay viable for years in the ground, so it's just really, really hard to battle. But if you provide, if you could just clear out some of it, even in your own yard, you know, the area you can control, then that really help benefit wildlife by allowing some of those native species to have, have a little bit of space and opportunity, and opportunity to grow. Here's an unused area. This was a, just a dry, weedy, eroding slope on the south side of our house, <clears throat> kind of this narrow strip. Probably a lot of people have a, a similar situation. It's just like not really useful for humans anyway, so why not make it useful for wildlife? So we made a, um, a dry creek bed. So it helps manage this, the erosion with the storm water. And then also we've got some wildflowers here, which is, which is cool. Uh, and some you know, habitat for pollinators and other critters. So that actually looks a lot better. I never got a before picture, unfortunately, but just imagine a lot of weeds. It was pretty bad. Okay, Liz, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Yeah. You got a few more slides and- Okay. So should I skip to the skip to the end? No, just just scroll through. You got some good images okay. here. Yeah, I'll just try to scroll through. Sorry, I I like didn't I did not pace myself well at all. I have a tendency <laughs> to ramble on, especially when it comes to birds. <laughs> so we'll just we'll just scroll through. We've had uh, we've seen this before. This is just contiguous space, and one of the uh, another tiger swallowtail butterfly that I found in that space. Another couple species here cool native ladybug. These are very rare now with the uh, Asian beetles that you see and a cool uh, bee right by my patio. Uh, be a good landlord. Safety, safety first with wildlife. So this is uh, a sharp shinned hawk. Took a woodpecker right off my feeder. Beautiful bird. Sad for the woodpecker, but hawks have to eat too. Here's our Here's our butterfly egg. You can see how tiny it is compared to my, compared to my thumb there. And then what a chrysalis uh, almost about to emerge looks like. You can actually see the monarch wings in there. Here we have a chickadee fledgling giving it space. I do keep track of the life cycle. So I know when these guys are gonna fledge and I give them plenty of space to do that. So I'm not interfering with their fledglings. That's a hole reducer on a chickadee nest box, just making sure that I'm keeping out larger species because I know what species are using this box, so I keep them safe. Really important, protect your windows, especially during migration. You can see how reflective that storm door is, that patio door is. Um, so I've got, in this case, I've got a couple different forms of protection, hanging paracord, some perforated film. Uh, almost uh, a billion birds a year die from hitting windows like this. And then of course, outdoor cats, 4 billion birds a year die, up to 20 billion mammals a year die in the US from free roaming cats. So try to keep your pets indoors, give them stimulation. Here you can see one of our cats out on the patio. Keep your bird feeders clean. I disinfect mine at least a couple times a year and clean them much more frequently than that. I just cleaned a bird feeder yesterday morning because it was looking gross keeping the area under, under the bird feeder clean. I built this patio. Would have been smarter to build it before I put the bird feeders up, but you know, I built it after. Fitting in with a suburban neighborhood. Again, we live, we live in a city, at least I assume most people here do. Um, so 
you know, how do you how do you fit in with that environment? Make sure you know your local laws that you're not violating anything. You don't want to be open up to complaints or at least legitimate complaints. You might have complaints, but decorative elements. I put this bench and some yard art in the front yard. Uh, I think that can help make it a more inviting space and demonstrate that, hey, this is not a neglected space, but some thought, some thought went into it. You see another decorative. I put this rock there. I thought that was kind of cool. I didn't engraved. Have a little bit, maybe think about your front yard as being kind of an advertisement. At least that's the way I think of mine. So this may be somebody's very first exposure to a wildlife garden. So I want them to come away with a positive uh, experience from that. And it may look a little different. Um, you know, it's not a traditional like golf, golf course manicured lawn, but at least they can tell that, you know, there was some thought that went into it and hopefully something that they might be inspired to say, hey, I can do that. I like the, I like, I like the way that looks and it's also functional for wildlife. So I tend to be a little more selective about how the front yard looks. That's the backyard. I don't know if I'd want that in the front yard. I mean, I think it'd be cool, but I don't know if how that, well that would go over to have all these tall plants back there, but that's really towards the back of the yard and it's, that's a little bit more wild. And just show people that you're out there, you're involved, you're, um, you're taking care of it. And you know, there's interesting things to see. So I go out, I'm always out in the yard, taking pictures, lots of pictures. Of course, that's why we get to have this presentation because I love taking photos. And also it gets people interested. Signs are really helpful. Let people know what your intent is that, uh, and maybe they'll learn something to it uh, as well. They'll maybe look at your yard and say, oh, what's, what's this bee thing? You know, maybe ask some questions. I've actually gotten a lot of questions about these signs. Um, sometimes perfect strangers will be walking by, passersby, and they'll stop and ask me about, well, what's a bee safe yard? And then, I, then we get to have a conversation. Um, and that's, that's a great stepping stone into some action. Social media can help too. Um, I, I'm not, I don't have tons of followers and that's fine, but you know, people are interested. They want to see pictures. And again, just anything to kind of spark that interest and start a conversation. You never know who you might inspire. It was my neighbor's son. He came over and uh, he was feeding chickadees in his hand, live mealworms in the hand. So I think, you know, one way to get uh, people involved is, you know, get the kids, kind of get them interested and then maybe the parents will get interested too. You can, host garden tours. I've hosted several. This is one of the Wild Ones tours. And again, that just gives inspiration. I learn a lot. Other people learn a lot, share ideas, that sort of thing. Um, it's fun and it's a great motivator for getting those uh, projects done in your garden. Fencing um, may or may not be something you want to do. We put up this fencing here uh, mainly to keep deer out. We have a lot of deer in the area and it kind of just defines that border. Again, we live in a suburb, so want to make sure that things are in control. And that can also help with any kind of ordinance, local ordinances and things you have like with compost bins or native plantings and that sort of thing. Avoid pesticides. Mosquitoes can be a big problem. So I try to avoid any kind of chemicals. So when I go out and there's mosquitoes, I wear long sleeves. Sometimes I wear my, my bug bucket hat, that sort of thing, non-toxic alternatives, whatever I can do to avoid any kind of chemicals in the yard that are going to harm, harm wildlife. If you have a lawn, you can uh, mow it at a high, higher height. You can use a no-mow variety of grass that we have here. Avoid chemicals, fertilizers. They, they don't help wildlife and they harm the environment beyond your yard. Um, and, you know, I think it can still aesthetically work. Uh, my grass is just as green as my neighbor's and he's pouring chemicals and mowing twice a week and all kinds of stuff. This is no chemicals. It gets mowed like maybe once a month and it's still you know, actually, I get a lot of compliments on my yard. I don't know if anybody compliments him on his uh, green, boring grass. <laughs> There's a leopard frog in the safely foraging in the in the grass. A pine warbler hopping around. No worries. No chemicals. Nothing. Nothing harmful there. These guys migrate through. They usually are up in the trees, but they'll come down low to forage for insects. Again, some more decorative elements, some paths showing that involvement. It gives you more better access um, to see what's going on, monitor for invasive species, and also just kind of enjoy and observe the garden. And so it's a nice decorative element. I'm almost done.
Okay, so what you can do in your yard today, even if it seems overwhelming to, you know, you, I've got to figure out what to plant and what plants to buy and all that sort of thing. Here's, here's things that you can really do now. You can, you can start identifying and removing any invasive species that you have. Clean your bird feeders if you have them. If you have them up, make sure they're mounted appropriately and they're clean, well stocked, all that. And nest boxes, definitely understand what species are using them. Um, make sure that those are mounted appropriately, safe for the, their occupants. Keep your cats indoors, especially now during migration, spring and fall migrations, especially, but year round would be great. Protect your windows. I put a few links on the resources for that, the things that I use. Um, go to garden tours or attend presentations like this, you know, to learn more, share ideas, learn from others, and talk to your neighbors about all these things. Spread the word. Your yard can make a difference. This is a rusty patched bumblebee. It's an endangered species. It's on the federally, uh, federal endangered species list. And I had this in my, I took this picture in my yard in 2018. During that year, there were 471 rusty patch bumblebees reported worldwide. This is one of them because I reported it. They have been reduced to less than 1% of their original range. This guy was in my yard. My yard is making a difference for this species. I saw this one in 2018. I saw another one last year. I hope to see more this year. Shout out for Wild Ones easing, Twin Cities easing. More information, more ideas, you can sign up. I put a link on the resources. Um, this is the first, first edition of it, I believe, and it's just got some great, great ideas and, and contributions from various Wild Ones chapters throughout the state. Last slide. I'm ready for questions. Thanks, Liz. Good job. <laughs> I got a lot of questions and a lot of comments. Yes. Oh, can you hear them? I hear everybody. Thunder supplies. <laughs> <laughs> so, so lots of back and forth, lots of comments on the side while you were while you were talking. But I'm going to start with a few of my questions, and we're just going to do 15 minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. So, um, just, we'll just keep moving along here. But what is the um, okay? What are a few things you did wrong for people who are just starting? Like you wish you wouldn't have done that in the first place. Well, I wish I would have spent more time up front getting rid of invasive species. I didn't know what I was doing. And then like I planted a bunch of stuff and then I had to keep just going back and battling, battling, battling. So I think up front, up front prep work could, would be really helpful. And also initially I didn't, I don't think I was even a member of Wild Ones that, when I first started, I didn't know what I was doing. And so I think just getting ideas and inspiration from and knowledge from other people, like connecting with other people, maybe a, a lot of including that in the upfront kind of preparation would have been really smart. <laughs> and I think garden tours kind of helped you too. Yeah, but I didn't do that. I didn't start doing that until after I'd already done a bunch of work in the back. Okay. So right. I just, I just decided one day I went out there and just started planting stuff and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. So, so in normal times, we usually have garden tours, well, ones chapters, mm -hmm. um, all throughout the state have garden tours. It's a really great way to, um, you know, get a look into what other people are doing who have done it for a while. You were going to do one this summer. Yeah. But not happening, yeah. but, you know, maybe next year, but it's a really great way to learn. It is um, very inspirational. Yeah. And then what are a few things that you serendipitously did right? Oh, um, well, we, uh, you know, in the front yard, I think it was smart to wait on that and not just jump into it. I actually had a landscape landscaper come and do that. Initially, the, the garden beds there for me. So like I mentioned before, I was really hesitant to do anything in the front yard. And I'm really glad I waited and, and, and took more time with that. So it, I, I feel just very strongly that it's an advertisement for wildlife gardens. Um, and so I think it's important that it makes a positive impact and when people, it's memorable, hopefully memorable and a positive impact on people when they come by. Yeah. So I, I think it was smart to wait on that. So I think you can get signage through what? Prairie Moon Nursery has a good sign. Yeah, um, well, Wild Ones has, has Wild some Ones signs. Does. Um, I have the Monarch, uh, Monarch Way Station sign and the Humming for Bees. I put a link uh, in the resources for that. They have those cool signs that are really visible. And then certifying your yard to the National Wildlife Federation. Yeah, I have, I think I have that in the links as well. I have a sign in the back uh, for that. And 
yeah, so you can like, if you have monarch habitat, you can certify as a monarch way station. And so I think participating in those programs is not only, you know, good to support habitat and, and those organizations, but also to educate people and to spark some curiosity. Because I'll ask questions. I've got lots of questions about those signs, like, well, what's a monarch way station? And then I get to explain to them about monarch butterflies. And, you know, every little bit helps. You never know what, what somebody might take away from that. So you're a birder. Um... And so that's how you got involved in this in the first place to attract birds to your yard. So maybe just talk about 30 seconds more about birds and insects. I think people think the bird feeder is food, but actually goldfinch are one of the very few all vegetarian birds. Um, and so just nutrition for the bird itself plus offspring. I know you touched on that, but that for me yeah. was a real important like light bulb moment, mm -hmm. like insects. I especially focus on migration when it's cold in this early spring, and I know there's going to be insect feeders coming through. So, of course, I have my bird feeders up. There's plenty of suet that they need. That's high energy in the winter. Um, birds really need that, so like suet and peanuts. So be, I rotate my feeders actually a lot, uh, depending on who's coming through. So I just put up my oriole feeders, my, my hummingbird feeders, uh, make sure to keep them clean. And then I scatter a lot of stuff on the ground. Uh, dried mealworms really especially for early migrants. If there's late snowstorm, you know, I'm out there lots just helping them out, just trying to, because um, I mean, it's, it's really hard for those migrants coming through and they get here and then there's, the flowers aren't blooming yet, there's that, they don't have as much habitat. Um, so just anything I can do to kind of help them on their journey. So that's, that's really good. And then to help them survive the winter. It's really cool too, uh, during uh, when the woodpeckers and um, nuthatches and everybody fledged, they'll bring their juveniles to the feeders. And I've seen like a family of pileated woodpeckers, and these are big crow-sized woodpeckers, come to the feeders. There's two adults, two juveniles, and the parents are teaching the, the young how to, how to uh, eat at the feeders and going back. And so it's really fun, fun for me to watch. And also, you know, I know I'm helping them out, but it's a supplement. It's, it does not substitute for, for the, nat the natural habitat and natural, natural food. So, yeah. So like your yard should be the feeder too, right? Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's the main feeder. The, 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 the uh, man-made feeders are, are to help them out a bit, but a lot of it is just for my benefit because I like watching them, but you know, it's a big responsibility. So I think people, another light bulb moment for me was, what's the statistic, 96% of um, birds feed insects to their young? And, and the, it's a massive quantity of insects that just one clutch of chickadees yep. requires? Six to 9,000 caterpillars because they're, that's what they're feeding their young. And so they're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to give them, and you wouldn't want to, it wouldn't be good for them to just feed them mealworms or whatever. They need the natural habitat and insects are very uh, highly specialized in what plants they can use. So in order to provide all those caterpillars for that brood of chickadees, you need to have native plants native trees, native shrubs, and that sort of thing. Those are host plants for those caterpillars, so that the chickadees will have that available to their young. Yeah, so it's, it's like I look at my yard and I think, how many clutches am I supporting? Like how many insects yeah. am I, yeah. And I look at some yards and I think, okay, no insects, so. But people, and you see, you know, a lot of people will plant exotic trees, they're not native, or sterile flowers that, that offer no, no benefit to insects. If you're not feeding the insects, then you're not feeding the rest of the food chain. And how do you clean your feeders? What do you say? You say, I clean them. What do you do? Yeah, so um, I disassemble them. So, it, you know, I try to buy feeders that are easy to clean because if they're easy to clean, then that means I clean them more often. So I'll dump the food out. Um, I disassemble the feeders. I'll fill a gallon thing with like a one to nine solution of bleach. And I'll soak them in there, brush them off, you know, scrub them off, dry, uh, spray them off with the hose. I do like make this, set up this big mess in my driveway and do all this. And then, like yesterday, I went out after all the rain we had. I noticed one of my feeders had, and it's not a particularly easy to clean one. It the seed was like gross and mushy, and I just worried it was going to get moldy. And again, I'm not going to leave a feeder out there that's that's going to harm the wildlife. So I I took it apart. It's kind of a pain to do. Dumped all the seed out. I didn't bleach it. I just scrubbed it with water and it got all, everything off of there. All the mushy, got rid of all the mushy food and then refilled it and put it back up. So there's and some squirrels. in the feeder. What do you do about squirrels? Their challenge? Yeah, we have lots of squirrels. Uh, 
yeah, I kind of, I, I went kind of fast through that section, but um, squirrel baffles. So you mount away from your house, away from your deck railing so they can't jump laterally. Uh, mount your feeders up on a pole or a post or something with a baffle on it so they can't climb. And then also you don't want them jumping down so you don't want it like under a tree. So I, I have pretty good success. Once in a while they'll jump down, off, they'll get lucky, jump down off the oak tree and land on the feeder. But for the most part, the only squirrels I get on the feeders are flying squirrels and I like those. So that's fine with me. I think the squirrels are winning my battle. <laughs> I, I'm losing with the squirrels, just like a lot of people on this chat are losing yeah. with the squirrels. Okay, so onto your water feature, did you install that yourself? The waterfall? Um, no, I had, uh, I mean, I think it actually could be a DIY project. You could probably do it pretty economically, but um, that's a lot of work. There's a lot of rocks and a lot of digging. So I actually had somebody come and install it. And because it's pretty far away from the house, I had to have a big, long, long tent trench uh, dug to install the electrical. And, you know, the, the guy that installed the water feature, he, he was like, well, you could run an extension cord, you know, and I would just want to make sure it's done right. So I copped, it was not cheap to have that electrical run out there. So it kind of depends on like the layout of your house and your yard and everything where, where your hookup is and all that. But um, yeah, that, I had, I outsourced all that. I wasn't going to do that. And what about moving water? The sound of moving water, you get more birds with that sound in the background? Yeah, they hear it and they see it and it really attracts them, especially, you know, during migration, you'll see like warblers and things that normally are going to stay up high in the trees and maybe not as visible. So, I mean, I, it's for their benefit as well as mine, because then I get to see them. And I put a little trail camera out there so I can always see what came. The other day we had like half a dozen rose-breasted grosbeaks all taking a bath. It's really cool to watch. And I, I planted inside the water feature, I planted some native uh, plants like marsh marigold and blue flag iris that actually grow right in the water. And it's amazing that the water's only like two inches deep and somehow that they freeze solid over the winter and then come back stronger the next year. And I don't, I don't know how they, they do that, but somehow they survive. Do so. you get insects in that water feature like mayflies or any other kind of? I had, I think it was mayflies, nymphs in there one year. And there's some kind of little teeny, teeny, tiny snails that I never could identify. Okay, I had a question about your grass, your eco grass, your no mow grass. What is it? And where might you source that from? There's a few different places you can get it. We got ours from Prairie Moon. It's that, that eco grass, specifically, if you look on their website. And we didn't pull out what was there. We just overseeded over several years. Again, that was kind of an experiment. And really, that was more my partner, Lynn, that her, she's more interested in that. So I was like, you, you can do the grass. I don't care about the grass. And what is so, the grass? What is it? I don't know what species it is, but it's some. Um, I can't, I can't remember. It, it, you can look in their catalog and see because they, they are on their website. Um, but it's, it's some a cooler season grass and it has deeper roots. And when it gets tall, it just flops over. So that's why, um, like in Bloomington, I think our regulation is like it, it can't be more than nine or 12 inches or something, you know, the, how the grass, the height. But the nice thing is this stuff can grow long and then just flops over so it never gets that tall. And I think it looks nice. I, I don't think it stands up real well to high traffic. So if you have kids or dogs, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how that would work because I don't have either of those things. So um, that might be something that you'd have to do more research on to see. And we've got Carlin saying, usually it's a mix of five or seven fescues, the eco grass, the no mow grass. It's, I have it in my front lawn and it's, it's, it's a nice soft look. I like it so much more than Kentucky blue. I just like yeah. the way it looks more. It's just kind of a gentle, soft flowing look. So um, I had a lot of questions about the cardinal flower. Okay. It's a beautiful showy yeah. little plant. Were you at the Design with Nature seminar when Larry Weiner was talking about the magic of the cardinal flower? Did you make that? I don't remember that. I, last? I mean, it's I one of those flowers that needs disturbance. And so okay. people say, oh, I planted it and it never came back. Or is it an annual? Is it a perennial? And, um, you know, for me in my garden, I take the seeds when they're ready and I just kind of scruff them around with my foot. You know, I just, oh, interesting. Okay. yeah, and I, it works. I mean, I've got cardinal flower that come back year after year. Well, they need a moist uh, soil, like um, they're really good rain garden plant. Which, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a stunning flower and it, it's a hummingbird magnet. So you have the conditions yeah. for that. It's, it's a great one. If you have a rain garden or some, some kind of yeah. damp soil. 
So back to your seed, back to your ecolon, how did Lynn overseed? Did she just go around throwing it around or did she do anything in particular? Or? Um, we put down uh, compost in the grass and then just overseeded it over several years. Just to, And it seems like it's really taken over pretty and well. How often do you mow? Um, again, she's in charge of that. <laughs> so maybe once, we haven't mowed yet this season. Okay. Um, okay. Once a month. But we do mow it a little bit short. What we found is if you leave it long over winter, then it then it flops over and it it doesn't come back quite as well in the spring because it's it's laid there all winter like that. So we actually mow it a little bit shorter, just with, like as a last. I don't know if that's. A, I'm not an expert on lawns, but that's yeah. we decided to try that last year. It seemed to work. Um, I'm kind of jumping around with the questions. I hope I'm not driving people crazy, but. Um, Back a few questions earlier, someone said, how do you know what plants to plant? I mean, are there certain plants that belong together? And like, how do I know what plants to buy and whatever? And I yeah. wanted to bring up the concept of native plant communities. I don't know off the top of my head that resource. So if there's some wild ones online here, if you want to look up the resource to finding native plant communities that um, shows what, what native plants historically um thrived together so that i mean i i kind of experiment i i put plants in my garden sometimes just to see how they'll work but if you really want a plant a garden that really is um working together plants that support each other because they know each other they're familiar with one another um i know vicky bonk tries to do this with nicomas naturescape which is a a garden that wild ones takes care of and we're always thinking of native plant communities and what plants belong together so that they, um, it, it gives you a more resilient garden, but do you have anything to say? Anyways, if anyone has a source on that, please post it. But what do you think about that, Liz? Well, I, you know, as I mentioned, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not really a gardening expert. A lot of my gardening was purely by trial and error. Um, one, a re Wild Ones is a great resource. I mean, there's so much you can learn, especially when we have the ability to go to garden tours and things, that's that's a great way to learn and to just communicate with members. There's so many helpful people that just have so much knowledge. Um, another good resource, and I put these on my resources links page, is the catalogs of Prairie Moon Nursery and of Prairie Nursery because they, a lot of times, will, if you find a plant you like, you can look and see what does this work well with, and they actually give you those suggestions. So that's kind of, that can be helpful too for beginners. And that's how I started out. I started out with some pre-designed little um, packages from Prairie, Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin that just had these different flowers. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And I still wouldn't say I have a lot of expertise in yeah. that. But it's also true that the plants will kind of decide for themselves. Like that big stand of Joe Pye weed that I had in the backyard, that big wall of six foot high Joe Pye weed. I did not plant it like that, but that's what, the plants decided to do. So I often think, you know, this whole idea of native plant communities is kind of an interesting one. It's like if you were tromping around with Lewis and Clark, what plants would be hanging out with each other um, way back when. So um, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions and then we're going to wrap it up. Can you talk about spring cleaning? Okay, so what I do is I, I wait um, until it's reasonably warm in the 50s and then I start I go out in the front and I start cutting those plant stems down to about 18 inches or so for the bees. I try not to stomp around in the garden beds too much because I don't want to disturb anybody that's actually under that leaf litter or in nesting or roosting in the ground or taking shelter in the ground. So I, I try to do like minimal to start with but I, again being very cognizant of the front yard being that advertisement is I go out there and I start cutting those plant stems. I don't, I don't blow out the leaves. There's no leaf blower involved. You know, I, I might gently pull out some leaves if I feel like they're kind of um, smothering some things, especially in the front where I have a little bit more like a sunny environment and um, maybe, maybe some of those plants wouldn't be considered woodland plants. So they don't want like giant piles of oak leaves on top of them. So I, I kind of just start up front and then I work my way towards the back. Also the springtime is a really good time to uh, look for invasive things like little buckthorn seedlings or garlic mustard before the other plants get too tall to really see through. So I go back and I, I did, it, you know, a couple weeks ago, I went back and was pulling some garlic mustard in the back. And I don't have a ton of it, but there's a little stubborn 
uh, area in the back. And once once that cup plant and the Joe pie weed and everything gets super tall, there's no way I'll be able to see the garlic mustard. So I, I try to get on top of that pretty early. So the whole, the, when I think of spring cleaning, I think about um, cleaning out all the critters. So like you showed all these, all this wildlife that relies on that litter to, to survive. And yep. so like doing it too early, you're just moving insects around that you never would even know are exactly. there. And all the, all the yard waste, uh, we don't have a yard waste service anymore. We're fortunate to have a large backyard. So everything that I do cut down and any leaves or anything that I do move just goes back under the pine trees. So um, the only things that leave our yard are any invasives like garlic mustard or uh, anything like that that I don't want to actually put in compost. And then we take that, you know, to a yard waste service ourselves for, you know, a couple bucks okay. for a, a right. yard of waste. So you know, we try, we keep everything in the yard, all the leaves, all the plant stems, everything. Okay, I'm going to do two more questions because we could talk all night, you and me, right? Sure. Um, someone wanted to know how many birds you found in your yard. What's your inventory to date? Okay, this is the only list I actually keep. So I'm not, I'm not one of those people that goes chasing after birds for their life list and checking them off, you know, how many, how many I've seen in Hennepin County this year or whatever. I know a lot of people like that and that's great, but that's not my thing. So my only list I really keep is my yard list because that's what I'm interested in. So my yard list does include birds that fly over. So pretty much anything I can see from my yard, I count. So I've, I've counted 93 species so far. Um, if, or maybe it's 98, it's either 93 or 98. If I said those that actually came in the yard, it might, maybe it's 75, 80% of that. So I'd have to go back and actually look at the list to make, to weed out the ones that were just flyovers. Cause like I count bald eagle, St. Hill crane, you know, osprey. <laughs> I didn't actually you know what I sound. I do the Christmas bird count with Liz every year and woo, she knows everything by sound and I just go along and long for the ride. I don't know what I'm doing. I know I know the ones I'm familiar with by sound. If you go with real like hardcore birders, they know all of them by sound. It's amazing. You'll see twice as many birds. Okay, one thing I wanted to wrap up with because I just find this fascinating is that we live on the flyway and um, we're really we live by one of the most important, the world's most important flyways, and we're so lucky to have that. And look at your bird number kind of reinforces that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think a lot of us realize this is just going on right in our, literally our backyards. So what we do in our yards here in Minnesota is incredibly important given our location to the Mississippi River. And I look at the same thing with the monarchs. I mean, we're really a terminal point for the monarch migration. I mean, some of them go up to southern Canada and whatnot, but again, we get, we get monarchs who stop here and then do their, you know, life cycles throughout the summer and then go back to Mexico. So I feel like what we do in our yards here in the metro is incredibly important, just based on that alone. Very much so, and I, I feel like it's a real privilege to be able to, you know, that these species have chosen my yard to make their stop on their long journey or you know, this is a place that they're going to raise their family, that sort of thing. You know, if I can help them out anyway, then that's, that's, that's a real privilege whenever I see that. I mean, I was just out yesterday and I saw, um, we had scarlet tanagers, we had a bunch of rose crested grosbeaks, orioles, um, I saw several warbler species out there and it's just, it's so nice to see we're just giving them a helping hand because if you drive around in a lot of places that they, they just don't have that habitat anymore. So any, any little oasis, that they can find is is that much more beneficial to them and they, they need all they can get. Yeah. Okay, thanks Liz. I'm just gonna wrap it up. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna do the two second advertisement for Wild Ones. Again, there's several chapters located throughout the state of Minnesota, several in the metro area. We normally do live programming from September to May. Um, we will pick up again in September most likely virtual, but we do have programming starting for next September, so stay tuned. Um, check out our website. Uh, we have um, a, um, our plant sale is just closed, native plant sale is just closed, but we do have another one for um, sharing, well, plants from our own gardens that we're gonna be doing that plant sale too, so there's information on that. The easing that Liz 
talked about. That'll keep you up to date on lots of things going on in the ecoscaping world. And normally we have garden tours. So um, we're all about learning and teaching and community and collaborating and whatnot. So thanks for tuning in and stay tuned to what we might be doing, or what we will be doing in the, in the fall. So thank you everybody. And Liz, I think that's it. Are we good? Yeah, I think that's all I have. Um, anybody, I'm, if anybody wants to ask follow-up questions, I'm always available. I may not know the answer, but I can help you point you maybe to somebody that does. And I love talking about birds. Oh, I've been told the plant sales until midnight online. So if you still want to buy, I guess you can buy until midnight tonight online. So the uh, somebody is asking about a link to wild ones. It's in that uh, PDF that I sent out. Or that I I think I got that. All right. Maybe not, maybe everybody didn't get the PDF. Wild ones. Oh, wild ones twin cities.org. So all right. Thank you. Thanks everybody.